on. Um, so I am Carmela. I'm Carmela Versuma. I run Plight, Nomadic Matt's nonprofit. Nomadic Matt is um, the creator of the Nomadic Network. And I'm just excited to welcome you all here to our Nomadic Network talk. Um, some, oh, actually, let me, there's a handy dandy presentation that I'm going to share with all of you. One second. Um, share screen. Okay, here we go. Can everyone see that? Okay. So welcome everyone. You are now a part of and joining the a Nomadic Network presentation. Uh, the Nomadic Network is a live community of events. Um, back when we started back in November of 2019, we had in real life events where we actually saw people and like were able to hug them and give them handshakes and all of that fun stuff, which we can't do now. But the next best thing is that we are able um, to have these virtual events that span the entire globe. Uh, sorry, this is one of my first time hosting these. There's a lot of happening. I'm letting more people in. Now we have 36 people. Welcome, everyone. Okay, so some things to keep in mind. Um, you can turn your camera on. We love to see your lovely faces. Um, you will be muted. Um, and so at the end, we're gonna have opportunities for you to ask questions um, with our, for our speaker, Phoebe. So feel free to, in the chat, if you think of a question during the presentation, like put uh, in the chat question in uh, all caps so that we can like remember the question and can scroll back to it easily. Or you can save until the end, whatever um, kind of works best for you. Uh, and we're so grateful to Phoebe and the rest of our speakers joining us. They're doing this out of the, the passion of their hearts and are grateful to share this knowledge with you. Um, and here, um, there are these awesome QR codes if you want to join the Nomadic Network. Um, oh, sorry, follow the Nomadic Network on Instagram. And the Nomadic Mat, and the Nomadic Mat Plus is a Nomadic Mat um, uh, membership network and so you get access to all of these recordings you get um, members only content on the website uh, lots of lots of things to even just deepen your your involvement in this community um, and some backstory to how i'm here um, so flight is nomadic maths nonprofit and we help work to create equity in the travel space and how we do that is that we work with students all across the united states and fully fund international trips abroad and we are so lucky and blessed that Flight is the charity partner of Crabtree Evelyn. They donated the funds to send an entire group of students abroad. They're actually heading there in just under a month. They're going from New Orleans to Puerto Rico, all thanks to Crabtree and Evelyn. Um, and it's just been such a wonderful partnership. So we're really excited today to welcome Phoebe and to welcome Christina, who's also on the line from Crabtree and Evelyn. Um, and so I will stop sharing this um, and I will introduce Phoebe, uh, one second. So Phoebe, the fashion, uh, sorry, fashion, passion for travel photography started when she was on a four month solo trip to India and Vietnam when she was just 19 years old. Um, and since then she has taken photo centric trips all over the world, places like Japan and Mexico. Um, originally from Brighton in the, in the UK, she loves busy places filled with people and thoroughly enjoys the spontaneity travel brings, which I'm sure so many of you on the call today can relate to. And so now Phoebe is the in-house photographer for Crabtree and Evelyn and brings all of their products and content to life. And as someone who's been working with the company for I guess we've been partnering for over a year now, like the photos that she produces are super beautiful and just portray the products and the people behind them in such a beautiful way. So I'm so, so, so grateful to have Phoebe on today to share all of her wonderful knowledge about portrait photography and so grateful to all of you for joining us again. Um, I'm sorry, one thing that I forgot to say is to, um, you know, uh, drop your where you're from in the chat. Let us know how many TNN events you've been to because we always like seeing um, where everyone's coming from. This is a global network of folks who love travel and who love doing this kind of work. And we're always so grateful to you for taking the time out of your busy days to join us. And so thank you again. Uh, and with that, Phoebe, take, uh, I'll hand it over to you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Carmela. So I have a presentation. Bear with me while 
I share. So um, thank you so much for everyone coming today. I'm going to talk a little bit about how to take better portraits um, when you're traveling and particularly when you're traveling solo. Um, so thank you for the introduction. Just a little bit about myself. Yeah, I'm from um, Brighton, but I now live in London, um, working full time as the in-house photographer for Crabtree and Evelyn. Um, I graduated from uh, University of West England um, on the west coast um, of the UK in 2019. Um, but really, I never even planned on doing photography as my degree. I actually um, went traveling to India when I was 19 and um, went with the camera. And while I was in India, decided that I wanted to be a photographer. Um, and so applied for my um, my BA while I was in India and then got into the BA while I was in India. So traveling really did um, kickstart my passion for photography. Um, and I'm so lucky to kind of do that full time now. Um, so, yeah, um, I am what I work for Crabtree and Evelyn's. Here are some of um, the pictures that I've made in the year that I've been with them. Um, so obviously the whole brand is inspired by traveling um but unfortunately because of covid i haven't been lucky enough to travel with crabtree yet um so up until quite recently really i've been um confined to my little house in southwest london making photos but hopefully fingers crossed in the future i'll be able to sort of travel around with them um and find more about where they get their inspiration um and hopefully leave my house at some point would be nice um, so let's dive right into equipment. Um, the way that I'm kind of going to talk about this is equipment that I used when um, I first went traveling. Because I was 19, obviously I didn't have endless money. I couldn't, couldn't spend all of my savings on equipment. So I'll run through the cameras and lenses and stuff that I've used to take the pictures in the presentation. I'm sure loads of you sort of have your own cameras. You may not be Canon, you might be Nikon or Sony, or you might even use your phone. Um, but if you don't know, I'll sort of run you through a few, few things that I've used um, and sort of the good and bad about them. So the Canon 5D Mark II, I bought when I was 19, I'm now 25. So I would still use that camera now. Um, it's 350 quid or $480. Um, Cameron's camera bodies now can range up to sort of like four grand. So it is a really good camera if you've got a little bit of a budget. Um, and then lens wise, again, lenses now cost three grand just for the lens. Um, that is by no means my budget or don't know if it ever really will be. Um, and so I've actually got the lens, the Canon 28 to 105 millimeter macro lens is what I use to take 90% of the portraits that I'm going to show in the presentation. Um, I'm not sure if you can see me, I'm like tiny in the corner probably, but this is the lens just there in front of you as well. Um, it's tiny, it's so lightweight, um, it's got a great focal length, perfect for portraits and landscapes, um, and it's a macro lens, so it sort of does everything. And it, you can, I mean, I bought mine for 70 quid, so like $90. Um, but I actually looked again recently and they're sort of even half the price now. So like in terms of what you need, I wouldn't even say get another lens. It's perfect to have on your camera. They, they stick out usually so far and it's difficult to kind of walk around if you're in a busy space. Um, but honestly, you can just keep this on your camera the whole time um, and it completely does the job. I swear by it. Um, Secondly, uh, absolute must must, regardless of what camera or lenses or whatever you've got, is a camera bag and 100% is a must is a camera strap. So I have uh, I have a photography like another photographer I'm friends with who just carries his camera in his hand. And I don't know about anyone else here, but I've got really small hands. And especially if I'm carrying a Canon, which are the uh, chunky cameras after half an hour and my hand is aching in this sort of like claw position um I'm not I'm not going to mess about with that so with a strap you can literally just have it on your body hide it with your arm and take pictures whenever you need to obviously safety is a big thing as well like be careful if you've just got it on a strap but you can be kind of mindful on where you're going 
Um, and then obviously a camera strap and a camera bag you can pick up for so cheap. Um, and these do feel like quite little insignificant things, but it's one of those things that if you completely get in a habit of using these things all the time, you'll realize that you just can't live without them. Um, so next, is a travel tripod. So I've been traveling, taking portraits and landscapes, etc., with and without tripods. I think when I was younger, I never used to take a tripod out. Um, but now that I'll sort of go away with more of a thoughtful intention of taking portraits, I have a little bit more time to think about what I want to do. Um, how I want to use the camera, being patient with my photos, seeing something one day and then going back the next day and thinking about different ways to shoot it. Um, and a tiny, a little tripod like that will really open up the possibilities. Um, this isn't necessarily a portrait example, but for example, say you're somewhere that has amazing clear skies at night, you want to, you you know that, you've heard that, um, and then you want to go out at night and do long exposures of star photography, resting your camera on a rock, I tr trust me, is really annoying. Um, so having a little travel tripod with you can really open up the possibilities of things that you can do. Um, and then the next thing um, is a reflector. I'm not sure if people are familiar with a reflector. It's like um, a circle piece of wire and a fabric that's matte white on one side and then shiny silver, gold or black on the other. Um, they're, they're so cheap. You can get a 30 centimetre one which compacts down into a cent 10 centimetre circle. Um, regardless of anything else that you bring, buy a reflector and bring it with you anywhere you go. It's literally like a portable light. Um, it's the complete difference between an sort of amateur picture of someone you meet and a professional portrait. Um, makes I cannot even stress this enough. It makes the complete difference to your image. I'll, I'll show you a few examples um, a bit later on. Um, but they're so cheap. Some of them compact. I mean, they're, it's a bit of a twist fold, but you fold them down. And some of them can be so small that you can put them in your pocket. Um, and obviously, having said everything I've just said, I know that lots of people shoot on their phone. Um, I've got absolutely nothing against that. I know that you can do great things on phones now. Um, I've never shot on my phone personally. That's only because I've always had pretty pants phones. So, um, and I also feel like while you can do certain things, there are things that you can't necessarily do if you've got a, a DSLR, but whatever sort of is your preference. But even if you shoot on your phone, get a reflector, honestly. It, it makes the complete difference. Um, so uh, how to make better portraits while on the road um, so they're not all of landscapes. Nothing against landscapes at all, but obviously we're all here to talk about uh, making pictures of people. Um, so some of the basics. To take pictures of people, you need to find people to take pictures of. Um, one of the best things that I've learned, sort of, especially traveling solo, is talk. It pushes you to talk to people, um, people that you wouldn't usually maybe talk to if you had the comfort of someone, uh, like a friend or someone with you. Um, talk to locals, talk to other travelers about routes off the beaten track. Some of the best people I've ever met are people that I've met on hikes when I'll go up on my own and they live in a village and I'll chat to them, I'll sit and have a coffee, I'll stay and talk to them and then make a photo of them. And you'd never meet, you'd never meet people if you just stayed and did the touristy thing. So go off the beaten track. Obviously I'm not saying run around on your own and be uh, do anything dangerous, but um, yeah, within reason, like do things that other travelers don't do, like be that difference. Um, and then super basic, but look around, like you can literally be walking somewhere a million people have walked, but if you get down really low or look up really high or climb a building or sit somewhere for ages and see how the light changes in the day, um, it can make such a difference and um, go out in weather, obviously within reason, don't do anything silly, but um, one of my favourite times to take pictures um, is after rain in cities, because especially on the black floor, you get all this water reflection, um, which makes the lights and stuff of different cities, like all colorful reflections. 
And especially at night, you can have a portrait of someone where the light is reflected on their face, like silhouetted face, um, which is really cool. Um, and then get creative, experiment. We all know that sometimes when you're traveling, you have a little bit of a, a day when you've got a bit of a lull, you're not really sure what to do. Sit in your hostel or your wherever you're staying and play with your camera, see all what everything does. Um, see what you can do with it and go out and go back to that same place that you've been and just experiment with things. Um, take pictures of yourself, like just be as creative as possible. It's not always going to be perfect shots, um, but you might discover something really cool that you can then implement later when you meet someone else. Um, so the next thing I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about it quite a lot which is the difference between environmental portraits and portraits. So environmental portraits, it's like kind of says what it uh, does, what it says on the tin. It's putting someone in the context of their surroundings, um, which obviously when you're traveling is so relevant. Like you could meet someone um, who has worked on a market stall for 60 years um, it's a family run business. You talk to them. If you're going to take a photo of them, you could set it up on a tripod, have them stay very still, have the market stall in the background and then have blurred people as they walk past. And it gives you so much more information in the photo and the environment around them is their story, like their environment, the whole market stall or whatever it may be, is the whole story. Um, alternatively, you can take a portrait just because someone's got an absolutely amazing face. Um, you can stop your aperture right down um, and have their background completely out of focus and just have a very simple portrait of someone with an amazing face. I think it's about your judgment um, and whether their environment is important to the portrait because, I mean, someone's environment can tell you so much about them. Um, so lighting, obviously, uh, one of the most, if not the most important things when you're taking pictures, um, you can do absolutely endless things with lighting. Like the reason that we have photos is because of light. They're basically just a collection of different light in a flat thing. That's basically what photos are. Um, you can really play around with it. You can use light to create interesting shadows. So this uh, portrait was made in Vietnam. Um, it's an environmental portrait. Obviously, you can barely see the guy in it. You can barely see his face, but his environment and the way that it's lit tells you so much about that individual. Um, top tip is avoid midday sun. I think every photographer will probably tell you that it is an absolute nightmare to shoot in. Um, you tend to get these shadows sort of under, under the brow, under the eyes and under the nose, which kind of creates this moustache look. Um, it's, it's a difficult one to shoot in, particularly with head on portraits. Um, the best light to actually shoot in is overcast. Uh, so obviously like a little bit of cloud. Um, but I'm not saying discount the sun because you can obviously do some really cool things with it. And I'm sure that loads of the places that we travel to are quite sunny. Um, but for example, if you are shooting in midday sun, always lift the chin um, and that gets rid of the, un the light under the eyes and under the nose. Um, and you can also do really cool things, obviously. If you're making a portrait of someone and there's a big uh, sort of palm leaf over them, and it's casting these amazing shadows and you do a very um, a shallow depth of field or something so that you can then have the eye in focus and the rest of the face out of focus with these big shadows. Um, but like I said, you can play with the sun, um, but just use it sort of like with intention. Um, the best, honestly, the best way to shoot, I would say, particularly with people um, is and on an overcast day, you light them from behind. So you have the main source of light behind them. You put the reflector in front of them uh, on the matte side. Otherwise, you'll blind them a little bit with the shiny side. And you reflect that light back onto their face. And I'll show you an example of that. It literally creates this really, this really soft, um, soft light. Um, 
And then also sunrise and sunset, obviously the classic golden hour. Um, these are very much, I mean, I would say that's much more of a beauty hour. Um, if you're doing something where you want it to be more of a beauty shot. And then of course, if you're wanting um, something of yourself for Instagram, that is, a, I honestly, 10 out of 10 would recommend the golden hour for yourself. Um, and then, so these are a little bit more in depth examples of the effect of a reflector. Um, the black and white image was taken in midday sun with the sun gleaming on his face, so not ideal. Um, but I put that reflector under him and just managed to bring out a tiny bit more um, from under his eyes and stuff like that. Um, and in both of these examples, I've zoomed in to try and show you, but um, you can see the reflector in the eyes. There are like two circles um, just on the underside of their eyes. And the difference this makes, like if that wasn't in the photo, it would make such a difference. The, it really, really brings out someone's eyes, particularly if you have an image where you've got sort of lens eye contact. Um, having that little ring of light in people's eyes makes a really, really much better portrait. Um, so this is a few principles of taking portraits, um, a few more technical things that we can go through. So um, to do environmental portraits, you don't actually necessarily have to sort of move back really far. Um, you can literally do it in camera. So both of these portraits obviously taken really close together, but I literally just stop down my aperture to give more context to the background or more context to the to the subject. Um, I think if you just kind of want to think about why you would do that, whether it's worth having the background and focus or whether it's better to have it more blurred out. But you can see the effect it makes as in the beach being so much more present um, or the subject being loads more present. Um, and then next is the difference between having your subject engaging with you in the image or looking away. So to with the engagement, I think I'll I'll get on to a little bit about um, how to go about engaging with your subjects. I think I don't actually have a preferred method. I think they just have much different effects. This, for example, just it makes you feel very aware that it's a photo engaged by a person. There could be a relationship there. There could be some kind of um, conversation or interaction with the person. And then this technique I call sort of like the silent photographer. Um, it's much more a technique to use when you're there just as a bit of a, um, a looker on. You're just sort of there, everyone's going about their lives, you're a spectator, and it's much more documentary style portrait. Um, I, like I said, I don't really have a preferred way of photographing and loads of uh, travel portrait photographers will do both. Um, completely depends on the environment um, and the situation and what you wanna show really in the image. Um, so next, I'm gonna go through some other photographers. I think, it's actually really important to um, look at other people's work and work out what kind of stuff you want to do. Um, Tommy Reynolds is actually a friend of mine. I met him doing a talk a few years ago. He is absolutely incredible photographer. He goes around um, and works and stays with people and works with people for months on end. Um, and then ends up making their photos. But you can see the complete difference as in, if he just went and visited, he would not get this, this standard of, um, of image. Um, and then obviously Steve McCurry, who is the granddaddy of, um, of travel portraits. Um, he has made some absolutely amazing work um, and is quite well known. I'm sure most people here have um have heard of him and that does lead me on and I'm sure that most people have heard of him because of this image um so Afghan girl obviously the girl with the green eyes I think it was featured on um life magazine and 
basically made him super famous. Um, basically, then a few years later, um, things, people started to sort of like think about the photo, how it was made. And in Afghanistan, the girl was um, in a uh, all girls school and her permission wasn't asked for the photo. And culturally in Afghanistan, girls with uncovered faces and um, making eye contact with men outside their household is seen as very like shameful. Um, and it had quite difficult cultural implications. And then obviously this photo was spread all over the world. Um, and it completely changed the way that the photo, what it meant. Um, and it did mean that it became more exploitative than representative. Um, and I think there is a certain responsibility with photographers, if you're planning on making photos of people from other cultures, um, to be respectful and mindful of what you're doing. Um, and this does lead me on to the respect and understanding of uh, local people you'd like to take pictures of. So it is a really complicated one, but I've done a little list of things that I've learned do's and don'ts, which are quite, you can implement. It's obviously very situational, um, depends on where you are, etc. But I think these ones are quite um, general. So do talk to people when you take pictures of them always not always but talk to people as much as you can um and even better and i could not recommend this more is talk to them in their own language i think it's it's not i'm not expecting obviously to learn a complete language but making that effort to have a basic conversation and ask someone as well to, to take a photo of them in their own language makes such a difference. It makes such a difference to the interaction you have with them and to the photo that you end up with. Um, I mean, it's really difficult. And I've been to countries where I haven't done that. Um, but when I went to Japan, Japan, I spent sort of a year learning Japanese so that I could take better pictures of people. And it was really hard. <laughs> um, and I would mess it up all the time. But just that basic sort of effort you're putting in say you have two people asking you for a photo one of them's asking you in English and the other person's asking you in your own language you're obviously going to feel so much more understood um, and have a better conversation with someone who's put that effort in um, next is take your time um, if you ask someone and they're happy for you to take a photo they'll be happy to sit there for a few minutes Honestly, it take take a second. It's fine. It's so easy to feel very flustered and think, oh God, okay, I've got to do this photo really quick. Okay, take it. And your shutter speed's too slow and you've got camera shake. And then you show them the photo and they it looks a bit iffy. And then so you leave because it's everyone's lost their confidence in the situation. Honestly, take your time, look at your settings, look at your light. Um it make it obviously makes makes a massive difference, and you don't want them to lose confidence in you, because um, it's the funnest thing ever. Like having an interaction where you talk to someone, you make their photo, um, and that leads me on to if you make someone's photo, send it to them, <laughs> get their details. Um, I have very many random people on my WhatsApp who I've sent photos through, or you could get people's emails. Um, they're also part of the process. I mean, they're more of the process than you are as the photographer. They're, they are a person with their whole life. And everyone, if they've said yes to a photo, they'll, they have a right to have a copy of it. Um, and also, that's, it's fun and lovely. It's a really nice way to take pictures of people. Um, of course, if someone doesn't want one, don't take it. Um, be completely polite thank you so much don't worry and walk away don't then ask the person behind them um, it's just a bit bizarre um, and this again is about sort of like settings but preempt your surroundings while you do have a few minutes to take a picture of someone you don't have half an hour um, if you've walked into a really dark market stop up your um your iso so you've got a really high iso so you know that if you take a picture you can have a fast shutter high iso and you will get a good shot you don't have to sort of 
mess about with your camera for too long. So sort of like preempt a little bit and be re um, ready to take that picture. Um, and then a few don'ts, obviously don't stick your phone or camera in people's faces. Um, it's not nice, it's rude, I wouldn't like that. I'm sure no one here would like that either. Even if they are the most unbelievably amazing face in the whole world, um, it's not yours to take a picture of unless you have permission. Um, I've seen it lots and lots of times sort of all over the world and the thing that will make you different is if you talk to them, you have a relationship, you talk to them in their own language, you ask permission and then you send them the photo. It's, it's professional and you'll get much better shots. Um, so to sort of contradict myself a little bit, I have obviously and do and will take pictures without asking. Um, but the piece of advice I'd give with this is research what you're doing, where you're going, the country you're in. All of these things will impact your own judgment of whether it's OK to take a picture. I um, whenever I was in Japan, I went to the geisha district and I know that you're not allowed to take pictures of geishas. So I just went as a traveller that wanted to walk around. I cannot tell you how many people I saw with their phones sort of like sneaking pictures. And I remember thinking, I mean, they're not gonna be good photos as well as it being rude and um, not really okay. They're not big, gonna be good pictures. They're not really worth it. Um, so sort of use your own your own judgment, research the area. Um, if, if anyone is offended, just say, sorry, delete photos. Um, it's really, it's not worth it. Um, and then again, this is a bit of a weird, ironic one, but don't go out just with the aim to make photos. Go out to meet people. Um, some people you'll meet and they'll be the most amazing picture, uh, the most amazing person ever, and you won't make the picture. Um, but some people it will feel right and you'll know that it's an interaction that you have with for the two of you and it benefits you both. Um, but mainly just go out to sort of meet people and have connections and tell stories and listen to other people's stories and then in turn you will find people that you'll make great photos with um so that's everything thank you so much for listening i hope that was um helpful um i've got a little bit of my information here and i'm sure there's a way that we can uh get people this document if they want it um so yeah happy to answer any questions if anyone has any awesome oh my gosh Phoebe there was so much information there and like I'm not even <laughs> like I wouldn't call myself a photographer but even for someone who doesn't necessarily have a deep understanding of aperture or ISO or any of that stuff like all those tips are super helpful and there are a lot of questions um in the chat so I'm gonna Ooh. go through them I took a little bit I took some notes um and then if any folks want to add on some additional questions um we could do that. So the first question came from Kinsey, um, and this was about the gear that you have. And so uh, the question is, would you worry about secondhand gear being damaged? Um, because I love the idea of buying secondhand. Um, uh, well, honestly, yeah. Like if I'm being honest, yeah. But something that I would say that if you're buying secondhand equipment is um, always ask for all of the specs most importantly ask for the shutter count of a camera um it depends on which camera you're buying which is a good like whether it's a good shutter count or a bad one but um for example my canon was secondhand when i bought it so and that was when i was 19 six years ago um and i think the shutter count was four thousand or something and that was fantastic and so look at how well used the camera is and through that you'll sort of be able to gauge um wear and tear um but i don't think i don't think there's any problem with sec second hand oh another thing is um if you're buying second hand buy boxed second hand so if the seller still has the box that's a really good sign it means that they're they've looked after the equipment they've kept the um the uh, the obviously the box and of, often like documents and stuff when they first bought the camera um, and somebody who does that 
looks after their equipment. So shut account and if it comes with a box, uh, two tips for buying secondhand. With a box one, that's interesting because I feel like as someone, again, who's not a photographer, I'm like, I just always get rid of the boxes. But to your point, someone who I think has honed their craft or really is taking care of their camera, like that's something they would just put it in storage, like just in case, like for the just in case moment. And yeah. I love that tip. Yeah. Um, next question. So uh, from Ashley, um, how do you use the reflector at the same time that you're taking the photo? Um, she's saying she doesn't have that many hands. So yeah, that's a great question. How do you, yeah. you're taking the, yeah, you have the camera and then you have the reflector. Yeah, what, how do you set that up? Such, no, that is such a good question. So basically what you do is I can take, I mean, I'm sure we can take pictures with one hand. You hold the reflector with this hand and then you get your model, the person you're taking pictures of, to hold it with their two hands here. Come on, stand up and show you. Hold it sort of like in front of them like that. And so it sits sort of there. And so you're holding it with one hand and it, they're so light, you can just sort of rest it um in one hand and then take a picture like this with your other hand um alternatively i have actually asked strangers to hold reflectors for me um many of the countries that i've been to um i've taken way more pictures of men than i have women um purely for cultural reasons as um as public spaces are more filled with men um, but sometimes when I've asked people for photos and then I've got out the reflector, they think, come on, this is a this is a good shoot then. Um, and they've called people to help. And so I've had people's wives and stuff all come out and hold reflectors like that. And it really adds um, adds to the fun of the shoot um, and to the sort of like the interaction of other people with you as a photographer. They take you very seriously. Um, and so they're happy to sit for many more photos, to be honest. That's great. It's almost like, see, again, I hear that as like, ooh, to actually to hack it and like look like you're like a religious, probably just like you carry around that like, <laughs> like, oh, I have this thing. <laughs> I know what I'm yeah. doing. Not, not saying don't do that, but I'm like, oh, that's like a really good indicator that someone has um, really thought behind what they're doing and like how they're doing it. How, I mean, I mean, a question for me, like how big do those, I know you said they kind of fold up, but if, if you're traveling around, like how much space does that like take up? Like, do you carry a backpack? Is it like clipped onto something? Um, so i have actually, hold on, I'll get my, this is my reflector that I have now. So the one that I went traveling with was um 30 centimeters. So that's like mm -hmm. tiny mm -hmm. like this. Oh. And it's, they they swivel and this one is 32 inches and you can see how small that is there and they right. basically swivel into themselves are so unbelievably light um and they can just slip into any part of your bag or pocket or like if you've got a satchel that you've got like out for the day um and then they be careful when you open them because they kind of like spring open like a pop-up tent um so, but honestly, they're the e they're easier to cam to carry than your camera than anything ever. So easy. That's great. Yeah, totally lighter than the camera. I love that. <laughs> um, so Ashley asked this question before you went into that kind of like do's and don'ts of um, like consent and all of that. But I'll just ask it again, and maybe you could share additional tips. Uh, uh, her question again was, how do you handle taking photos of people who are strangers? So many times she asks, um, and in this. Or sorry, so many times I ask in these situations and they ask me to pay them for allowing to take their photo. So what would you do in a scenario like that? Um, that is a, another really good question. I was actually speaking with um, a friend of mine about this the other day. We got into a conversation about it because there is not really a right answer. Um, I have given people money for, for, for photos loads of times, but the way round that you do it is the thing that matters as in i've never said here's some money can i take a photo it's always been i've taken it chatted to them taken a photo and then they've asked for money and i don't think there's anything wrong with that i think if that's the exchange that they're they were comfortable with the photo that's the exchange that they want um they have complete agency to ask me that um i think the only the difficult thing does happen when 
like um, the quote in the question, it said that I'll only let you take the photo if I can have money. Is that what was said as well? I think that's what it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is a difficult one. I think um, there's nothing, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. If that's, if that's what that individual wants um, for the photo, I mean, I think that's fine. I think it depends um, on the photo, whether it's, where it is and stuff as, um, like that as well. well. I don't think there's anything anything wrong with giving people a little bit of money, but I think the, the way in which I was talking about it earlier in terms of sort of chatting to someone without an intention of taking a photo with them is sort of the main thing that you want to do because if you're having a conversation with someone thinking, oh, I can't wait to use my camera, you're not having a proper conversation with them. Um, and generally, if you have a real conversation with someone and you're just chatting with them, you accidentally sat next to them on a bench and you say, hello, like, where's good to eat around here or whatever, and you talk to them, um, a photo usually wouldn't be, I haven't been met with, it, with any problems um, or people wanting sort of like a financial exchange because um, the conversation has been real. Um, but it, it is a little bit of a difficult one. And I think it's sort of like up to your own judgment, really. That's a great answer. And I think what you're emphasizing, and I, I love how you're, how you're framing it, is it's all about the intention, right? It's all about, you know, I'm not here to take like this award-winning photo. Like I'm here to have a conversation and if a photo happens as a result, then that's a beautiful thing. So I love um, the mindset by which you go into those interactions. Um, so the next question is a little bit more technical um, from Alex. Um, the question is for spontaneous pictures when just walking around, do you have your camera on either aperture priority or shutter speed priority? Okay, so I shoot um, only on manual, but out of the two of those, um, ooh, it's difficult really. I would always more likely prioritize shutter because um, with an aperture, if you're shooting, it depends on the distance you're shooting at, um, but there is nothing you can do about a camera shake. And so if your shutter's too low, um, it will be shaky and blurry, and then that's just no good to anyone really, is it? So out of the two of those, I would say shutter priority, um, but out of all three, I would say try and shoot manual. Um, and then you've got a whole a whole world to play with. Um, and also on manual, you don't have to prioritize either of those things because if you're somewhere where you want a really fast shutter and you want loads in focus, so you want a really, really um, a really high aperture, so small hole, big number, um, you can have a really high ISO. So you can have it'll be grainy, but you can have everything then if you're shooting in manual and you don't have to choose between the two. Got it. Well, I would have asked a follow-up question coming from me. So um, I would imagine the folks on this call, there's a wide range of knowledge of photography. So not for you to go into all the basics, but what are some resources or tips to learn some of the basics that you're mentioning? So aperture, ISO, and I know that's all for an actual like DSLR. Um, and then maybe if, if you have them, like if someone just has their iPhone, is there something, I guess, not that this is like an iPhone photography class, but like if you, if you just have your phone, you just so happen to be out with your phone, like, mm -hmm. is there any tips like for, I guess, technical things when taking photos of your phone with your phone as well? Yeah, so I actually have a, a tip with an iPhone is that um, one really, really good thing about iPhones is that even even um, though they're so wide, like the angle is so wide, you don't actually get lens distortion like you do in uh, camera lenses. So um, a tip for iPhone photography when you're out is just zoom out, like just really make the most of that really wide angle. And they're really like great quality now and you can always zoom in, but honestly zoom out, make the most of, um, of that uh, lack of lens distortion. Um, and then in terms of learning about new things with your camera, I think genuinely I've learned so much more just doing it than being told anything. I completely 
understand that so much information like this is like and with me always I mean now still um but if you want to learn about stuff just use the camera you can sit in your room or sit wherever and take one picture change every single setting take it again change every single setting take it again see what happens they'll be shaky they'll be really overexposed they'll be underexposed but eventually you'll work out how to coordinate the things to get what you want um but yeah just keep doing it yourself because once you do it enough times it becomes just sort of reflex and then you'll be able to do it really quickly in the moment when you think oh I've just made this photo but the background's really out of focus change this one thing and now it's in focus I've got it because I've done that so many times that's right I love it I love that because I think with anything but I think especially with photography there's this desire to get it right right away but I love how you're sharing that it's like it takes a lot of trial and error um and I guess I mean a little bit of a tangent but with digital cameras now like you kind of have unlimited opportunity it's not like you have a film camera and you only have whatever it is like 20 to 30 shots so um yeah. I love that yeah that's that's great advice oh definitely uh, I mean I'm so trigger happy I've got such a bad um habit of once I've made one picture, I'll make one picture, I'll make like five versions of exactly the same thing. But there's mm -hmm. just absolutely no need to do that. But right. I still do that. <laughs> well, as you say that, it leads to the next question, uh, for, uh, again, from Ashley. Um, in the last few years, um, they've heard more people saying that they make photos rather than take taking photos. And uh, they'd love to hear you talk about the difference between those two words. Yeah, I I actually had a feeling that might come up because I'm very aware that I say that. Um, I genuinely just think it was something that I heard quite a lot. I like Ashley. I heard quite a lot. Um, and whenever I was actually like studying photography, I think there's a certain thing with photography where for a while it wasn't really recognised as art. And like if you make you make art, you don't take it you're not taking it from anywhere mm -hmm. you make it regardless of what it is um and so i think just the language with it is just kind of giving photography a little bit more credibility <laughs> in terms of it actually being art as opposed mm -hmm. to something very technical um I, like all of these technical things do not make an artist at all um your sort of like your intention and the creativity and like the interactions you have of what makes the artist um so that's why i say make um yeah yeah actually that was a real, i was wondering that too because and it makes so much sense once you've explained it that way so it's like you make a painting or you 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 know it's like a creative it's more of a creative verb versus mm -hmm. take which is more of like a i don't know it's more of like yeah, a transactional yeah. verb yeah that's so interesting um <laughs> So those are all of the questions, um, but I actually had one more um, for me just out of curiosity. So I know I love how you mentioned that um, like one of the do's was to share the photo like with the person once you've taken it. Have there any been any like longer term like friendships or interactions that have resulted from you? You know, you, you WhatsApp them the photo and then I don't know, like, have you ever met up with someone afterwards or has there ever been like a longer Kind of like relationship or friendship that resulted from something like that oh uh, yeah yeah for sure i've um i've had a few friends i made a friend in mexico that um i took their portrait and like sent it to them she was a very similar age to me um and so we're kind of like still friends on instagram and um i really want to go back to mexico and do it a little bit differently to how i did it last time um and then in japan as well honestly like honestly japan if you speak Japanese, a little bit of Japanese, you are everyone's favorite person in the whole world. And I um, I went to the arts university in Japan to meet other young artists and creatives and stuff like that, just to meet them for fun. Um, and really got on with this girl. And then she invited me to go to a barbecue with her and all her mates. Um, and so I like made some portraits whenever I was there as well. And we're like still in touch, but I've been, the main the main thing of why I'm in touch with them is because we just really got on. Mm. Um, and I think if if portraits kind of manifest because of that, that's great. Um, but also we just we just really like each other and we're just friends. <laughs> oh my gosh. I I love that so much. Um I feel like 
it's, it's interesting because this is a, a talk about portrait photography, but I think it's a really great reminder of how to be a more deliberate traveler because, you know, you never go into the, these, I'm, it sounds like you don't go into these uh, situations being like, I'm going to take this awesome photo of you that's going to make me famous or that's going to do X, Y, and Z, but it's like, I'm going to go and like, just try to be like, immerse myself in what's around me and, you know, talk to the person next to me if you just so happen to sit down next to them. So I love that. Um, so it's, it looks like we have all of the questions answered, but maybe any kind of final words or tips that you'd want to share um, about portrait photography with the folks on the call? Um, yeah, so um, best piece of advice is it's really scary asking people to take pictures but just ask them like just ask them the worst thing that someone can say as long as you're polite and nice about it the worst thing that someone can say is no and that's fine um if I look back and I think about all the times I was kind of lingering unsure of whether to ask someone I would tell myself off and say you should have just asked them and you should have just like asked them and spoken to them and I mean I don't know maybe it's a English cultural thing of being a bit awkward and shy but um <laughs> But honestly, I would just just ask people. Yeah. Um, and just keep doing it. Just make loads and loads of pictures. Some of them will be pants, but some of them will be absolutely amazing. So yeah. yeah. I think a lot of us are awkward and shy, especially now. So I love <laughs> that advice because I think it's so relevant. Um, and even just for you know in, immersing yourself in 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 a, in the surroundings of where you're at. Um, so I know we're just at about time, but I also wanted to open up the floor. Um, to actually, wait, uh, Kevin has one last question. I just saw it. Um, do you edit the photos before sending them or do you give them the raw photos? I always edit. Um, I don't uh, retouch anything, particularly travel photos, um, but I'll do like a color grade and I'll maybe do a crop or something like that, but I'll send them the, com the completed photo um, just because that will be the best version of it. Um, and that will always make people the happiest because it's the most professional way to do it anyways. Um, so yeah, whether you edit or not, just a little bit of a, a color, like more saturation, something like that, just to make someone feel um, like the photo was done very seriously and they can get the best photo as well. That's great, thank you. And thank you, Tevin, for that question. Um, so now I wanna open it up to Christina um, from Crabtree and Evelyn. She has an exciting announcement for the group. Hi guys. Well, thank you so much, first of all, for being part of this talk and conversation. We always love to see this incredible community get together. Uh, thank you so much, Phoebe, also for going through all your tips and tricks. I've been working for Phoebe, with Phoebe for a year now and like hearing all these little insights. <laughs> I'm really excited. I'm a iPhone picture taker, but now I'm like, maybe I should buy a camera. <laughs> um, and being also like the community experience manager here, it's you not know, very similar to what she was saying to building relationships and like kind of like getting to know really the person you're taking the picture of and like building something strong together. So I think that's really great. Uh, and then we are doing a giveaway this time after this event. So look out for one of our emails. Uh, one lucky winner will win. Uh, a little kit from with all our products in it most of our products in it so um carmel will send out the email to the lucky winner and i'm going to copy also on the chat our instagram page so you can take a look of all the precious photos that phoebe took throughout the years with us and mm -hmm. also like all our new products activations and events coming up Awesome. Yes. Thanks, Marmela, for hosting. You're always, always incredible. Yes. Together. Thank you so much for having Thanks, me. Thanks, Christina. Uh, and thank you for the giveaway. So, Crabtree and Evelyn, I honestly am a little, I don't use a lot of Bath and Body products, but they have shared with me all these other things. I use toner now, and it's awesome, and I can tell the difference. So, I'm a believer. So, I'm excited for whoever wins the giveaway. Um, I shared my screen one more time um, just to go over a couple of things, more things about. The nomadic uh, network um, so again we are part of nomadic mat and if you want more event replays some monthly giveaways like some you know tea about mat that he doesn't share on the website um, feel free to join nomadic uh, nomadic mat plus um, the qr code and the link are here um, there's a facebook group free guides like all these other perks the giveaways are really awesome i think the other month they gave away like 
flight or was it a hostel phase? It was something where I was like, oh, I wish I could join a medic net plus and win these freebies. But anyway, um, join it. Um, it's a great community. A lot of folks on here are already a part of it. Um, we have a bunch of events coming up, um, including um, things about how to go out, travel gluten free. If you want to, you know, have a Cambodian uh, tuk tuk adventure. So many talks we have. I want to say at least two to three a week, maybe even more. Um, and then we are we want to share also about this book club that's happening in two weeks um, with Dr. Anu, which. I personally am super excited about it. I'm actually gonna be hosting it. Um, and I tell people this is required reading if you wanna go abroad and understand the world um, and travel in a deeper way. Um, all of us here or all of us who have the privilege of travel have some type of privilege which allows us to go into other countries and explore. And this book really wrestles with the hard questions of what happens when you're in a place where you feel inequity and you feel the weight of the world and how and the challenges of like this the world that we live in um, hitting you. So if you're a traveler from the USA going to a place like India and just are experiencing um, a developing country for the first time, how to navigate that, all those emotions and how to be as responsible and ethical of a traveler as possible. I cannot recommend this book enough. Um, the book club is in two weeks and it's a, a shorter read. So it, it's been more than enough time for you to read. And even if you don't get through it, um, Dr. Anu is wonderful. So I welcome you all to join that. Um, and thank you for being a part of this community. And I hope to see you next time, either myself or Laura or Erica or uh, Leia, any one of our other hosts, um, thank you so much for being here. We know that there's a million things you could be doing right now, but you chose to be here with us. So I really appreciate it. Um, and so with that, thank you, Phoebe. Thank you, Christina. Thank you to all of you um, for being here and for joining us.